just to go back to the concept of uh, abyssability and the physical, and probably you have some physical and some biological um, properties that somehow, some physical process and chemical that boil down to our perspective of habitability, because one of the things we talked at the beginning with Jim is the fact that you need water. Mm. And, and and I, for example, I myself have the question is why NASA has this CETES project and at the same time wants to send people on Mars when but there's no water. So apparently Mars is not a habitable planet. Um, so in your perspective, as a geomicrobiologist, what is habitability? And what is intelligent life? Yeah. So yeah, so habitability we all know is um, the availability of liquid water. Again, this is the Goldilocks zone. The, the, we live in the Goldilocks zone. Doesn't mean there aren't other planets out there in, dif in different galaxies or different solar systems that aren't in the Goldilocks zone. And in mm -hmm. fact, that's how we estimate how many planets are potentially habitable because they're in this zone and they're surrounding a planet that's roughly the size of ours. Uh, uh, sorry, a sun that's roughly the size of ours and that sun is roughly halfway through its life. So you've got the right temperatures, you've got the right light conditions. We're assuming habitability is like us on Earth, that the, we have the, the evolution of life on a different planet. We'll go through a microbial phase to a phase of more complex life. And by complex, um, it's not necessarily multicellular. It's not necessarily macroscopic. You don't have to see it. One thing we assume as humans that you have to be able to see life for it to be intelligent. And I guess this is a bit of an, an issue, right, that I have, that um, we narrow our thinking down to our experience of the universe when there may be many other experiences. See, a bact uh, for a bacteria to build a spaceship is going to be a lot easier than... No, um, that was a joke. So. <laughs> a bacteria <laughs> yeah, spaceship? Yeah, they're very yep. tiny. But, um, for example, when you, when you think about intelligence, how we've evolved from microbial to more complex um, animals and plants, for example, you remember when we talked about the great oxygenation event mm -hmm. when mm -hmm. cyanobacteria, blue-green algae, started to produce all the oxygen that our atmosphere uh, required to sustain higher life forms, higher life forms, more complex life. And some of those complex life forms then went on to be intelligent, so-called intelligent. And we measure intelligence in various ways, um, but it's interesting to look at the, uh, the tree of life, as we discussed mm -hmm. last week. The tree of life contains bacteria, archaea, and then the group called eukarya. And there's about 30 or 40 branches or phyla in eukarya. And I think we were talking about one branch that we're quite close to is the branch for mushrooms. And another mm -hmm. branch really close to us is bananas, for, for examples of what's mm -hmm. on the branch. Um, but when, you, when we think about intelligence and start to say what, what life forms on Earth are intelligent, we boil it down to a few things like, um, you know, the ability to learn, the ability to be self-aware, the ability to uh, plan. Right? Ask questions. <laughs> Things like that, yeah. ask questions, right? And then, then we say, well, that's quite subjective. You know, one person smart or intelligent is not necessarily another person's smart or intelligent. But you could, um, you could be more objective if you say the ability to use tools takes or the, the need to use a tool would take some planning and refine the way it's used so you adaptation and you're aware of the fact that you need a tool so self-awareness um, these sort of behaviors are usually what we use to say this this life form 
and we only class animals as being intelligent because we, we know that plants don't move. They don't need to move because they get all their energy from the sun. They're quite happy to sit there and photosynthesize and wait to be picked up and eaten. <laughs> but typically, you know, they're you know, some people might say they're highly evolved. Some people may say that mm -hmm. the human race is regressing to a point where they're stuck on a couch and don't move around too much either. <laughs> and people can bring them food. But um, <laughs> where was I? <laughs> okay, so intelligence in the animal kingdom. There's two phyla out of those 40 or 35, 40 phyla or groups of animals. There's two that we would say have intelligence. And one of them happens to be the us, <laughs> hmm. me, like the geomicrobiologists, mm -hmm. no, okay. humans, and the other in, in, that, in that same lineage is birds. So in the, in the chordae yeah. or the chordates, so those things with skeletons, for, for example, there's two groups that we really say, like the primates, the humans, except or that group that use tools, and a, a lot of birds use tools. And, mm -hmm. and in fact, look into mirrors, right? Which leads me on to the other group of animals that is often said to be intelligent is the cephalopods. Yeah. So the, uh, the octopus, or that group, the cephalopods, is said to be the other group of intelligence. So we've got birds, the human lineage and octopu octopus, right, cephalopods. They say the self-awareness in cephalopods is similar to those in humans. They know how to use a mirror and mm -hmm. they know how to learn uh, behaviour. Mm -hmm. So this mm -hmm. is where we're, where we're up to. We can't really communicate with cephalopods or octopi, but we can, humans can basically communicate with birds.